Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Tampa, Florida, where we're covering the National Defense Industrial Association's annual SOFIC Conference and Trade Show, world's leading gathering of special operators and the companies that serve them. Our coverage here is sponsored by FLIR Systems, and we're honored to have with us Jim Smith, a uh, retired U.S. Army Colonel who is uh, the Acquisition Executive for the U.S. Special Operations uh, Command, uh, West Point uh, graduate. I say that because there's going to be a question at the very end of this uh, conversation about uh, Army, uh, Navy uh, football, in which you have a passing uh, interest, and congratulations uh, on your uh, son being uh, also at West Point and continuing the family tradition of service. Uh, uh, let me ask you, um, you know, you are uh, relatively new to the job, but you were part of the dynamic duo with Hondo Gertz, uh, where you guys were rewriting the acquisition book to an extent that Congress studied what you guys were doing and set uh, into motion a whole series of acquisition reform changes. Uh, the uh, new administration seized upon some of those uh, as well, and Ellen Lord uh, has looked at that from uh, the, from an uh, OSD perspective. Uh, and each one of the services are working to make acquisition more agile. From your perspective, now that uh, you know the, the big job is yours and the responsibility is yours, um, talk to us a little bit about what your priorities are from a process perspective about how you intend to both, both continue the good parts of what you guys were doing, but how you intend to refine shape as, you know, you always want to keep continuous excellence and keeping the ball going forward. That's right. No, thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, we, we're very fortunate in U.S. SOCOM that we've had a long line of, of acquisition leaders that are interested in agility and responsiveness to, to a combatant command. And that's really the unique environment we operate in, is that combatant command environment. So my priorities are really four. My first one is an elite workforce, and that's going to sound a little bit like, you know, motherhood and apple pie, but the truth is my workforce supports elite special operations and my workforce works with an elite industry base, right? I don't think anyone would argue that America's industry base for the defense industry is, is the most elite in the world. So my, my expectation for the workforce is to be elite, to support those operators and to work with that industry base. Um, the good news is they're pretty darn close to that right now. It's a great workforce. Um, the second priority is to team with the, the headquarters the, the, and the soft enterprise. Uh, again, that sounds like something that might be uh, obvious, but it's not something we take for granted. We're very fortunate to be co-located with the command. Uh, I sit on the commander's staff. I work very closely with all of his other uh, JDERs and his, and his uh, oh, sorry, uh, his joint directorates, uh, with his uh, combatant commanders and with his TSOC commanders. We've got a great relationship there. Uh, so that allows us to be very responsive to requirements, to know what the command's uh, priorities are, to know what the command's budget constraints are, and to be responsive in that, in that domain. Um, the third priority that we're working on is uh, to drive the industry and academic intellectual uh, base. And again, that may seem obvious from a SOCOM perspective, but the truth is we're only 2% of the DOD budget. So it's not something I take for granted. It's something that we work constantly with for industry to understand what our problems are and to keep those lines of communications out. And this really gets to that agility piece uh, where we're taking the new uh, tools that Congress uh, has provided and OSD has pushed down to get after working with industry in a, in a responsive manner, again, appropriate for a combatant command. And the last one is to e exceed the agile acquisition um, uh, expectations that, that the DOD and Congress has for us. So my belief is when, when Congress stood up uh, US SOCOM 30 years ago, they absolutely wrote into the language that we'd have an acquisition executive responsive to the commander uh, and, and um, under the authority of the defense acquisition executive for soft peculiar equipment. And there's magic in those words. And they expected us to be agile, and so we want to exceed those expectations uh, from the get-go. Um, let me um, ask you about uh, the changing priorities. Uh, ch there are changing national priorities, but also General Thomas, commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, has also talked about the emerging and changing challenge, uh, that we're now at a time of great power competition. So SOCOM has got to be able to execute all of the missions that it's executing now, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in Afghanistan or Africa or, or even in Asia. While overlaying something from your generation, not to date you at all, but you know, when, when you were a hotshot special operator graduating West Point, you were going to the Berlin Brigade, where that was a force where Russian special operators were worried about what you guys were going to do in the, event, in, in the event of a fight. Uh, always good to be striking fear in the hearts of Spetsnaz guys and GRU guys everywhere, but I digress. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how your acquisition priorities are changing 
as you re-gear from what it is you've been doing for a very long time and get back into a business that you were very, very good at when you look back during the Cold War 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, let me first correct the record. I was never a special operator. No, no, I know. I'm just saying that if, if you were, there were some hotshot guys who were going there. But no, I understand. I just want to make sure that no, I didn't give the impression that I was a, a long tabber or something like that. I was just a straight-leg infantryman. Um, but I do know what you're talking about. And... Uh, you know, I think that the, it's really important to understand that what the national defense strategy calls on us to do, right? The national defense strategy calls for us to be ready and to be relevant uh, and to be lethal or effective in a near-peer state-on-state uh, competition scenario. Um, we, uh, but in that construct, as you probably know, is, is also the ability to continue to keep the door closed on violent extremist organizations. Um, so our relevance there continues. Uh, and the exquisite capability we've built in the violent extremist organization uh, fight will continue. Um, but as you stated, you know, we've got to shift to a certain degree to be ready for uh, what comes next. And so many of the things we're talking about are the environment we've dealt in for really the last 17 years has been benign in some ways. It's been benign in, in, the, in, the, in our ability to control the uh, RF spectrum. It's been fairly benign in our ability to have assured communications uh, in, a, in a clean signals environment. Uh, it's been benign in that we've owned the air domain. Uh, so these are all things that we know we cannot take for granted. In fact, you know, current operations just over the last 18 to 24 months have shown us what a dirty battlefield looks like um, as we get just in proximity of all the, some of these more capable forces. Not in competition with them, but just in proximity. Uh, so it's, it's made us think harder about how do we operate in a GPS-denied environment? How do we operate in a dirty comms environment? Uh, how do we operate um, when, um, you know, the potential forces that we're operating with have sensors that are on par with our sensors in terms of our ability to keep our operators from being detected. What are the things you're asking industry for? What are the big problems you want solved that you're looking to and the message you're delivering, um, you know, in as much as you can discuss that, what are the things you want industry to deliver for you? What are the big problems you need solved? Yeah, I think, uh, so what General Thomas was very clear about in his remarks, and, and I tried to re uh, reinforce, is this idea of what SOCOM does more than anything else is bring a highly capable operator to the, to the battlefield. Uh, and that operator may not be the kinetic uh, door kicker that we think about from the movies, et cetera, but it could be uh, the analyst, it could be the logistician, it could be the um, uh, information support operator, those folks that need to have the ability to operate in a soft environment. And how do we enable them? And so there's this digital domain, there's the, this data that's out there that we all enjoy uh, that is potential to overwhelm those individual operators. So how do we take that data, uh, apply learning to it, uh, you know, I won't say machine learning, it could be in the multi multitude of different uh, uh, technologies that are out there, to turn that data into information to enable the decisions of those, of those great operators. So I think the biggest technological challenge we're looking at is those software applications that can take data and format it, provide it to an individual operator in a potential, you know, stressful environment that they can make decisions based off of better information. Are there any, as you look out uh, in, in the world, and one of the great things is, you know, there are um, a lot of vendors from a lot of different countries here. But as you look at the special operations capabilities of our adversaries, potential adversaries, whether it's China or Russia, what are systems you see them using that make you think, hmm, we need to do things a little bit differently than what we were expecting to do because both of those nations have invested very, very heavily on building special operations capabilities that they intend to use, presumably in ways that may confound us. And frankly, if you look at North Korea, tremendous special operations force with a lot of, a lot of capability and a, and a proven track record of brutality there as, as well. What are the systems you see out there that make you think, hey, we, we, we need to maybe consider doing things a little bit differently than we've been doing them? Yeah, no, I, I, it's a great question. And, I, you know, I think to answer that a little bit differently than maybe the way you asked it is, one of the things we're seeing is a great capability by some of our uh, adversaries in the social media domain. Um, we think we've got a great story to tell. We think what the U.S. is trying to do in, in every part of the world is it stands up to scrutiny. Uh, we need to be able to get our story out there in the social media space. Um, and that's a core competency of SOF. You know, uh, the military information support operations is, is part of the SOCOM responsibility. Um, and so our ability to tell our message uh, to an audience targeted to the right audience at the right time uh, with the right message is really important. Because I, I think, it, you know, as you know, 
um, there are adversaries now that seem to be beating us to the punch a little bit in the social media space. Um, and that's an that's an understatement. If you look at, for example, Russia's fingerprints on on everything, both whether uh, the accusations in, in terms of the U.S. elections, but certainly almost every you know European election has Russian fingerprints on it that are that are very devastating. How are you in that space? Um, the alliance has capabilities that it's set up, the Cyber Center, for example, in Estonia. How are you working through them with Cyber Command, given that you have this very, very important piece, you really are the front edge in a lot of places where you're operating. How are you working through the alliance, through DOD, to, 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 to work the kind of unique requirements that you guys have in how you're using this capability? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I would differentiate a little bit between what Cyber Command does and, and this military information support operations. You know, we've been doing military information support operations for, for decades. And currently, you know, we've got a pretty good core competency in, in print media, in broadcast media. Uh, it's this social media space. So I, I wouldn't necessarily call that cyber, unless, you know, cyber is a very big noun. Right. Um, but, you know, and that, that's not a cyber comm mission. The information that we provide uh, over those uh, net networks uh, and to get to those populations that may otherwise not have connectivity. Gotcha. Um, you work, uh, you don't develop big systems. You draw them off of each one of the military services. Mm -hmm. And in, in this case, each of the services want to be agile, and they've always shown um, or, you know, uh, had a willingness to work very closely with SOCOM to have adaptations of those systems going into your hands. How are you working with the service acquisition executives to shape their plans and have them always bear you in mind in developing whatever you're, 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 they're developing so that you don't have a bigger job at the back end of this thing to sort of turn a round peg and try to jam it into a square hole. Yeah, we have a great relationship with the services, and, and we have to by necessity. You don't you don't get an, an Air Force uh, or a SOCOM AC-130 without the Air Force's C-130. You don't get a, an MH-47 without, a, without the Army CH-47. Um, one of the things we benefit greatly from is my program executive officers all come from the services. So in other words, my program executive officer for Rotary Wing is an Army uh, aviation officer who came from the Army aviation community. He'll go back to the Army aviation community. Uh, my program executive officer for Maritime is a line Navy uh, captain who came from the Navy uh, shipyard uh, industry, quite frankly, and she'll go back there. Um, same with my PEO for fixed wing. Air Force officer that will go back to the Air Force. So their connectivity back to the service, um, we often lead term um, what the services are doing because of that connectivity. I'll give you a great example. Uh, for those MH-47s, for the longest time, the modifications that we were doing to the Army CH-47 to turn them into a uh, SOCOM MH-47 were pretty extreme. We'd almost tear the things down to, the, to their ribbing and then build them back up as SOCOM uh, MH-47s. The Army has followed suit in many cases in the, in, the, in the technologies that we've embedded in these aircraft, and now the delta, the difference between an Army MH-47 in the near future and a SOCOM MH-47 are far less severe because we've all gone towards the same requirement. How are you, um, as you look at the budget, uh, the big question everybody has in the consensus view, which could be wrong, but is now the consensus view that 18 is high, 19 will be high, but 20 is going to be flat or declining. As you, and, and we've heard senior leadership talk about that as well and concerns, and that's assuming that the economy remains strong and interest rates remain where they are and the debt doesn't become an issue that collapses a lot of government spending as some fear it, it, it will. Um, what's the philosophy you're using, the strategy you're using, as you look at, you know, you're going to get a, you got a bulge of money how are you working, planning this, and what's the way you intend to plan and work past 2020 in the event that you don't have as much money as you'd like? Sure. Um, you know, I think we've got to be cognizant of what we're doing to the industry base. So you've always got to be cognizant of if we've got a fairly low production rate and then we ramp up for two years and then we come back down, what's that do to the industry base? So we're working with our industry partners on that. But I'll also tell you that, uh, you know, again, the National Defense Strategy talks about this state-on-state -state competition. Um, what we're finding is it's not even state-on-state -state competition. Even in some of the environments we're working on now, where we're operating in now, where we're just near other peers, we're realizing that we, this 17-year focus on uh, combating terrorism has left us um, behind the curve in some other areas. So we're really going to use, and I think the intent of the budgets for 18 and 19 is to catch up on those areas where we have not maintained uh, the capability where we should. Um, you know, 
chemical and biological defense, for instance. Uh, that's not an area that's been a focus for us for the last uh, 15 years, but no matter what happens next, we know we need to have uh, a competency there. So we're going to build up that uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Um, and, and, you know, the list goes on. It's all areas where it's, it's regardless of what happens next, it's areas where we have not focused for the last 15 years, and we've got, we've got a little bit of a catch-up to do. Um, from one of uh, one of the areas is unmanned aerial systems, which uh, are you know there's a lot of focus on that, both on the detector side of things, uh, on the denial systems, but they pose a unique challenge because our troops have actually been attacked with unmanned. You know, the Air Force prided itself on decades saying, hey, the last time an, an American or an Allied airman was attacked from the air was during the Korean War, and actually that's happened since because of these unmanned systems. Um, and a number of folks said, hey, you know. Ask Ask, ask Jim to talk to you about that because that's the biggest challenge he faced. Do you agree that that's the biggest challenge you face? And are you comfortable with the systems? Are you comfortable with the systems that you're seeing and the solutions you're seeing, perhaps I should ask, to that very, very vexing problem? Yeah, I actually absolutely agree that this is a problem that we, we need to get after. You know, it's a, there is a casualty aspect of it, but there's also a psychological aspect of it. And there's a psychological psychological aspect to it to not only our forces but our partner forces. So the idea that we don't control the space over our heads, uh, that, that's something we've got to address. So to give our forces confidence and our partner forces confidence that uh, when you operate with us, we can, we can protect the airspace above your head. Um, we view this counter UAS problem really as an instantiation of the counter IED. It's just another asymmetric means that the enemy is using to apply some force against our forces um, that affects our ability to, for freedom of maneuver. So we, we look at it more that way. The services are looking at it from a standpoint of air defense, and that's appropriate, and we'll benefit from that, uh, that as well. But to protect our very small formations and our partnered operations, uh, we're looking at some more, much more mobile, uh, man-portable, low-power uh, type of equipment that we can detect, uh, first of all, and if we can detect, uh, ideally be able to defeat. And if we can defeat, can we exploit and analyze that equipment? Uh, so that's really important to us because part of our intel cycle is knowing where that asset came from, whether it's a UAS or an IED, and being able to trace it back into its network and attack the root cause uh, and not just the, uh, the instant data instantiation. Let me ask you about partnership. No command benefited more from its allies, perhaps, than Special Operations Command. Special operators were shoulder to shoulder, whether it was U.S., British, French, Polish, German, were all working together in Afghanistan. Many of the same countries worked together in, in Iraq, saw each other's gear, ended up buying a whole a variety of stuff from a variety of different sources. How important, especially, you know, you could argue, in a, and a couple of people asked this, in a Buy American age, what, what are the challenges associated with it, and are these alliance partnerships still important? and is the door still open for the ideas that a lot of people uh, one floor above us are, are showing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, that's a, so the door's wide open. Uh, and, you know, one of the interesting things about working at SOCOM in the acquisition environment is you just naturally take on the culture of the command you're supporting. So SOCOM, as you stated, is naturally a partnered organization. That's, that's a core competency for SOF is to w operate with partners. So that, that culture flows into the acquisition side of the house. Uh, and so we're wide open, as you stated. If we find technology in another country that is something we need, we will go after that technology in, in a partnered way. Um, as gr I, you know, a great example of we were looking to change all of our M-Razors from gas uh, engines to diesel engines. Uh, we happened to hit a, a point in the budget cycle where we were under a continual resolution and we couldn't, get, uh, we couldn't buy the engines. One of our partner forces went out and bought them for us sent them to Fort Bragg for us to test them. We found that there was, you know, great efficacy in the, in the engines. We've gone out now, we've changed over the whole fleet from, uh, from gas to, um, to diesel because of that enabling partner force that uh, was able to help us get that jump started. Um, there are some folks who say that, um, you know, SOCOM is great. It's got, you know, it's got softworks. It has all of these sort of extra governmental, if you will, organs to try to solicit good ideas and bring people in the door and get that dialogue going. But time and again in this hall when I said I was going to talk to you, they were like, hey, ask them whether or not all of these are just designed to give us a nice warm hug, pat us on the butt, and get us back out the door while still sticking with programs of record. How do you, how do you address that? when folks in this very hall who've taken the time, the expense to come here, have a feeling that some of this stuff is designed to just sort of mollify people, to, to just give them a way to sort of vent, hey, listen, saw your idea, 
that it's it's more show than than reality. How do you address that? Yeah, no, that's a it's a great question, and I, I can only say that it, it, that it's not. It's really important to us. The network is extremely important to to grow that network, uh, to have that dialogue, to see technologies, to partner on technologies. Some of them might not stick to the wall. Some of them might might be a dead end. Some of them we want to take forward. Um, I could give you a specific examples in the mo very recent past where we have stopped a program of record, uh, the material solution we were pursuing for a program of record, to go with another, a different solution that we had found uh, elsewhere. Can you say what that was? I, I'd prefer not to, okay. um, but, uh, but I can just tell you that's part of being part of the command. You know, we presented that to the commanding general. We told them the facts, uh, and he was able to, you know, in a, in a Friday afternoon meeting, say we're going to stop doing this and we're going to invest in, in this path. Um, and so there's a, an agility there working in a combatant command that does allow us to deviate from programs of record. Hondo has said, and others have said, hey, you know, small is beautiful, that one of the reasons why SOF is able to do what it is is because it's small. Um, but from your perspective, what is it that gives you speed but the right outcome? You can be fast and screw it up. Yeah. You're fast and not screwing it up. And so as everybody is working to try to study the lessons of SOF and to then inculcate them at a bigger command level, from your standpoint, what are the key elements of this of fast and right? Absolutely. So, I, you know, I, I, I agree with, with Hondo, small, small is great. You know, I am chartered to work only on things that are peculiar to SOF, SOF peculiar. Uh, and that almost naturally puts me into a, a category of acquisition that requires the least amount of uh, oversight. Um, so we're not talking about big ticket items like aircraft carriers and next generation fighter bombers that we're working on here. We're working on very tangible equipment that's going to be put in the fight in the very near future to support these combatant commands operations. So the oversight that we have is reduced. We also take that oversight and we push it down to the lowest level. So I've got about uh, 77 programs of record. I retain milestone decision authority at my level for four of those. The rest I push down to the 06 GS-15 level. Uh, so th where you make decisions matters, right? That gives you that agility. If, if my, my folks can know that they are steps away from the decision authority to keep their program on track and keep moving, that, that enables that agility. But I want to say one other thing. Um, you know, my workforce is around 300 people. If you look at the number of people that are employed working on soft acquisition problems, the number is closer to 1,200. Where are those other people? They're out there in the services. They're out there in the Army at Natick uh, in Picatinny. They're out there in the Air Force at Wright-Patterson. Uh, they're out there at the Navy and the Navy uh, uh, Warfare Centers, uh, all doing work on, on uh, soft acquisition. Those folks are all using the same authorities from their parent service. So it really is, it's a matter of what they're working on, not so much of who they're working with. Um, the services are absolutely as agile uh, in that same space as we are because Quite frankly, we're using them. As I mentioned before, the, our personnel come from the services, uh, and we leverage the services for their support. And you've been feeling that agility drive over the last couple of years. Absolutely. No, I, the uh, you know agility. from the from the top down. What I'm saying. Yeah. No, and I, I think that's that's been a consistent again that you know the culture of the command drives the culture of the acquisition environment, and so that agility is soft to manage risk, to empower people to make decisions at their level. Uh, and to react to a change in a situation. In my, in my world, that's a change in budget, that's a change in threat, that's a change in technology, that we've got to be agile enough to uh, adjust our acquisition strategy to get after it, just like our operators have to be agile enough to, op to adjust to operational changes. What uh, the top I was saying is even from OSD, you're feeling oh, yeah. that drive for yeah. extra speed. Absolutely. No, and that's what I, that, that fourth line of effort that I mentioned, I really believe Congress and OSD uh, want us to set the pace for agility uh, because we are a combatant command. It's a unique authority. No other combatant command has it. Um, and our mission is different by, de by definition. And you're, um, I'm about to get the hook, so do you think Army, you're a West Point family, you're joint, you're purple as the day is long, but you still bleed Army green or black and gold. What do you think? How do you think the big game's going to go? We already heard from uh, David Ray from FLIR. He was an Air Force guy, Air Force Academy. He's like, hey, we're going to win the, the Commander's Cup, so we really don't care what's going to happen. How do, you, how do you call it? He's delusional. Yeah, <laughs> go Army, beat Navy. Go Army, beat Air Force. <laughs> and, and that's the last word. Sir, thanks very much. Thanks Jim Smith, it. Acquisition Executive here at US SOCOM. Sir, thanks very much for being so generous thanks. with your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Good talking to you.